Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I am excited to introduce board-certified family nurse practitioner, Jackie Meinhardt, a Georgetown graduate who specializes in neuroinflammation and biotin exposure, vector-borne illnesses, and chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jackie. Thank you for inviting me. Can you share with us a bit about your background? Yes, um, I was traditionally trained as a nurse at a Villanova University. Um, and became a nurse practitioner through Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Um, that was about 10 years ago. I specialize um, as a family nurse practitioner, and now um, I also received my master's in integrative medicine at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and now I'm going back to get my doctorate at Georgetown University. And you've had the good fortune of meeting and now working with Dr. Andy Heyman. I did. I met and started working with Dr. Andrew Heyman in 2015 um, when I moved to Loudoun County. It was the perfect scenario that could have happened. I was not familiar with chronic inflammatory response syndrome, quite frankly, anti-aging, prior to meeting Dr. Heyman. Um, and he introduced me to a whole new way of thinking about medicine. So was it that introduction that brought you to APRM? I started learning with, through the modules um, and then also through George Washington University Integrative Medicine. Mm -hmm. So how has this type of education changed your perspective in your role as a nurse practitioner? Well, we all learn the same things, right? It's all, we're all taught the same thing, whether it be traditional or integrative. It's the lens through which you look at the information. Um, and it's not just treating the patient, a pill for an ill, I call it. We all call it that. Um, it's actually looking at the root causes of the disease process. So you can treat patients all you want for that symptom, or you can try to find the underlying cause of that disease process. And that's how I came to become involved with A4M. It's looking for the root cause of that disease process. So you are now faculty here at A4M. So how did that come about? Working with Dr. Andrew Heyman, I have become a uh, certified practitioner with Dr. Richie Shoemaker, um, who is based out of Maryland. Um, and we treat patients by and large. 90-95% um, of our population, patient population, is the patient who's been exposed to either a tick-borne vector like Lyme or Borrelia burgdorferi um, or mold exposure in a disease process called chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So you're teaching physicians and all types of practitioners on how to correctly identify and treat SIRS, is that correct? That is correct, yes. It's physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, chiropractors, any sort of provider that has hands-on capability to identify the patient um, and then to refer them, actually, either treat them or refer them to a provider who understands a little bit more in depth what this disease process is. Can you go into detail about how mold and other factors or predispositions come into play? Absolutely. So in the patients who are genetically predisposed, and we estimate roughly 22% of the population, or roughly 40 million people, have this genetic haplotype. It's who you are, we can't change that, but it tells us how to treat you. So that patient whose primary symptom is fatigue, or chronic fatigue, or pain, or fibromyalgia, um, that migrating pain that happens, that brain fog and fatigue and cognitive dysfunction, you actually can see um, through symptom analysis, symptom cluster analysis, how patients, um, how they are uh, affected, um, root cause being an innate immune system activation. So that innate immune system, which works by antigen presentation, the body's ability to identify that there is a bacteria, virus, or parasite in their system, the innate immune system, the innate immune system says, whoa, 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 you don't belong here, right? It tags it and off it goes to kill, the acquired immune system goes to kill it. Where in that genetically predisposed patient, for whatever the trigger, that innate immune system gets activated and it never fully transfers that communication to the acquired immune system. 
right? So that patient never fully mounts a true immune response. How do you mitigate it? So what we know is that patients who are exposed, right, or who are triggered, um, they uh, present with a number of symptoms, right? We diagnose them through blood work, through potentially different diagnostic tests like an MRI of the brain with a neuroquant analysis, um, through a variety of other different tests that are exposure, exposure as well that usually are covered by insurance. Um, we diagnose them and then we have them test their environment. So it's not necessarily mold that's in their body, right? But it's mold in their environment, keeping that immune system active, right? So it's all about education for the patient and for the patient's family and for their, their, their loved ones, for their work environment, right? If they're being constantly exposed to different types of pathogenic molds, they're never fully gonna get better. Now, the number one comment I get from patients and from patients' family and other providers is molds everywhere. You know, you're right. It's the pathogenic molds that we're looking at and their fragments. So in terms of the basic steps, step one would be to remove yourself or the patient from the exposure. Is that what you would do? That's right. Mm -hmm. It's to get the patient out of that exposure um, and then to help um, decrease the amount of toxins that are in their system because of that innate immune system activation. So how do you go about that? So we have a variety of things that we could do, either at a traditional pharmacy or out of, um, out of over-the-counter supplements or nutraceuticals. Mm -hmm. We've got a variety of things. Um, I meet the patient where they are, right, with what they can do. Um, and if sure insurance covers it, then that's something I always try to work on as well. So we have a variety of things we could do. Can you discuss the types of mold? It's um, mycotoxins exposure, correct? So it's a biotoxin. So there's, um, there's roughly 36 to 42 different biotoxins out there. Um, and they range from different types of fragments, from different types of molds. Um, but then also to any innate immune system activation that can create something called a cytokine, right, in the immune system. It's a, this specific type of immune response that happens. Um, and that can be caused by um, the interior of water damaged environments, think of particulate matter, um, but then also fragments of different types of bacteria or viruses that are in the system as well. So what types of symptoms would someone who's been exposed to these types of mycotoxins, what kind of symptoms would they be having? Oh, the number one by and large is fatigue. Everyone comes to us, um, patients come to us, and I want to say roughly 98% have some unrelenting fatigue related to either insomnia or a disrupted sleep cycle. Um, and then they also have um, something called brain fog or subjective cognitive impairment um, or uh, mild cognitive impairment. Is there any manifestations of this on the skin or perhaps pain? So they have migrating pain. Um, so oftentimes it can be a specific body part that always hurts, but then there's also migrating pain. So it may be my right arm hurts today and my left leg hurts tomorrow. Um, it could all be related. Mm -hmm. So it's this, this type of um, discomfort that can happen throughout the day through different body parts. So mold is everywhere. But as you said, certain people are much more reactive to it. And this is all actually identifiable through different types of lab work. So it's not that we're guessing. We can actually see these changes that happen um, in diagnostic testing that we do, which is very important. You have to be able to test someone to be able to identify who these people are. For also example, patients who you treat who are not getting better. Right? So you can identify, wait a minute, this, we've treated this patient with antibiotics for a tick-borne vector and they're not improving. What do we do? That's where I would say this is a perfect next step. So that's a great segue over to talk about Lyme disease. So I grew up in the Northeast. I played in the woods in New Jersey. And I remember hearing somewhat about ticks and taking some precautionary measures when I was a kid. But it seems as though Lyme is far more prevalent today than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. So what's up with that? That's a great question. And um, with the research that I've done, it's actually, are there more ticks? Yes, there are more ticks, number one. Um, speaking with different entomologists um, who happen to be patients, um, and they can give us local data in Loudoun County where I work, um, number one. But then also, it's overdevelopment. 
honestly. Um, when we talk, we'll look at Lyme disease and Babesia, Bartonella, Ehrlichia, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, it all has to do with um, actually getting rid of certain protections in the environment. Um, one of those protections being um, getting rid of all the trees and driving the fox out of the neighborhood, right? Because the fox is what kills the mouse, which has the ticks, right? So the, the, and then the ticks go from the mouse to the deer, and then they go back and forth, right, from that mouse, and the mouse go then into the houses. So it actually has to do, when I, I remember reading it and saying, well, that makes total sense. You're getting rid of the predators. And that actually is one of the reasons why you see this bigger, especially in Loudoun County, which is, you know, there's a huge amount of development. They're getting rid of the predators. Can you speak about the complexity of diagnosing and treating Lyme disease? Well, number one, Lyme disease is, I always joke, it's a tricky bug, right? It's a tricky bug to find and it's a tricky bug to treat um, because number one, by and large, the testing is not very accurate that we have um, in the available to us right now um, through traditional laboratories. Um, the Western blot for Lyme is not very specific and it's not very sensitive to what it's trying to find. Those are actually medical terms to how to evaluate a diagnostic test. So they are not specific, meaning they can properly identify a bug and they're not um, sensitive, meaning they can identify true positives versus true negatives. So roughly between 68 to 72% effective at identifying the bacterium um, or the spirochete Borrelia, the Lyme. So the testing isn't very good. So how do you know, number one, they have it? And then number two, how do you know they've gotten rid of it? If you don't have proper testing, it can be very difficult. And then you have patients, or I'm sorry, you have providers who treat clinically, right, with cl clinical symptoms, um, you know, and that can be very difficult, but what's the risk benefit to the patient? And that's always where I have to stop and say, wait a minute, what's the risk and what's the benefit to this patient with long-term antibiotic treatment? Um, and that's how Dr. Heyman and I um, really started looking at chronic inflammatory response syndrome because, you know, could there be something else going on? It's not just Borrelia, it's not just Lyme. Could it be that innate immune system activation that happens because of that tick bite or the physical emotional trauma or the concussion or um, a different type of pathogen like um, fish that have been infected or swimming in red tide, which has been all over the southern states um, and even in the northern states, you know, it's, um, it's very pervasive. How would the traditional approach differ from the integrative approach? So with chronic inflammatory response syndrome, you have to first identify if their environment is safe for them. Again, it's not necessarily mold that's in their system. It's mold that's in their environment that's keeping that immune system active. So number one, remover from, removal from exposure, number one. But the number two, you start something called a binder, which can either be prescription or it can be over the counter. Um, and we counsel the patient on that, what's best for that patient, um, and depending on their blood values, their, their testing that has been done. So um, it's multifactorial um, and to treat a multi-system um, disease process. Okay, so how does cell hypometabolism play into SIRS? Absolutely, so what we're looking at now is something called transcriptomics um, in that chronically inflamed patient. And that is doing a special type of test that's looking at the up or down regulation of proteins in the transcription process. So when you have your DNA, right, you have your genetic sequencing, um, which is looking at your genetics. But then um, when we look at transcriptomics, it's when that genetic sequence um, transcribes into new DNA, right, because our cells turn over Right? We don't just have the same cells in our body. We turn those cells over to create new cells. Um, every part of the body this happens in. So um, in that transcription process, that genetic sequence gets um, potentially affected by different types of inflammation, um, different types of medications. You know, if you're happy or sad, um, if you're being exposed to a different type of pathogen, whether it be bacteria, viral, or parasitic, um, many things happen to change that transcription process. And so we're looking at um, the up or down regulation of protein in that transcription process, and that specifically deals with um, hypometabolism of the cell in the chronically inflamed patient. Um, and it's a, if you think of it simply, it's a defense mechanism, right? The cell's trying to protect itself from something called apoptosis, which is where their cell 
dies. Um, and ideally, you, you, you want to save, the cell wants to save itself. So it's a way of protection. Wow. And it's, it's pretty new. Uh, it's a new concept being heavily researched at multiple, multiple venues around the country and the world. Interesting concept. And what about genomics? So you have a genetic sequence, and we, there's lots of over-the-counter testing available for your genes, right? Um, you could probably turn the TV and see two commercials right now about looking at your genetic sequence. But most importantly, when you're looking at those genetic sequences, is just because you have a gene for something doesn't mean that it's turned on or that it's turned off. That's where genomics comes in, and that's how you can identify if that gene is turned on. So it's not do you have green eyes or blue eyes, right? Um, it is is that genetic sequence activated? Um, and same conversation, different part of a conversation, different part of a, um, a theory. And that's why preventative medicine and precision medicine is so important. Yep. Perhaps you can intervene and intercept to decrease the risk well, wouldn't that be fantastic if we could look at the transcription of a, the transcriptomics of a patient and say, you need to, uh, you know, really do, some people say lifestyle medicine, look at the lifestyle of the patient, whether it be the food they eat, the environment they live in, um, the medications or supplements, nutraceuticals that they're taking. Is there a way of decreasing risk, right, to stop that hypometabolism? That would be fantastic. This is an exciting and evolving area which you are involved with. Absolutely. It's, it's very exciting and it's very fast moving. Um, and it can be overwhelming, not just for the provider, um, but also for the patient. So, you know, being able to keep up with literature is challenging for a provider. Being part of the literature making has been a fantastic, you know, being able to be part of the discovery has been a fantastic journey for me. Um, and being able to help teach other providers on what to look for, number one, but then also what do you do with the information once you have it? We now need to test and then you need to be able to interpret that data. Um, and it's been fantastic. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And thank you again for joining us. It's been my pleasure.